welcome everyone to our fourth installment of London Calling. And I have to repeat this because there might be someone new. I'm Gloria Kondrup, the Executive Director of the Huffman Smoken Center for Typography. Um, I'm always excited to have this. Of course, Sonia, we would have loved to have you in person here. Oh, I would have loved to be I know, there. in Los Angeles. <laughs> I'm going to turn it over to my guest host and colleague, Professor Simon Johnston of Art Center College of Design, who's also the creative director of the Hoffman Smoken Center for Typography. I will disappear and pop back when it comes to the Q&A, so I'll be able to sort of, you know, wrestle the cats at that point. And um, Simon and Sonia, welcome. Thank you. Uh, and thanks to everyone for joining. Um, we're so happy to be able to present uh, the next installment of our London calling series. Uh, very happy to, to see Sonia again. Sonia um, runs Atelier de Arcova, um, which is a, a visual communication agency in London, uh, creating brands, publications, packaging, spatial and digital design for forward-thinking brands, I'm reading, um, and cultural entities. Um, it says here, her approach is, and it's true, her approach is firmly rooted in conceptual and typographic experimentation, developed through research with attention to tactile details. Um, Sonia is previously responsible for the redesign of Freeze Magazine. Um, she's worked as a creative uh, a consultant, creative director uh, at Hauser & Wirth, one of my favorite galleries, um, for two years, and still works with them on a variety of projects. Uh, and she also worked for many years at Fiden Press. So I don't know whether we're going to see some work from that period, but for sure. um, great. Sonia, welcome. And as, as, Glo as Gloria mentioned, um, uh, I'll have some questions for you after you finish your presentation. I'm not going to interrupt you whilst you're presenting. That's uh, okay. But look forward to chatting to you uh, after we take a look at your work. Great. Welcome. Thank you so much. Um, so let me share a screen so I can start great um yeah so as simon said um we are a small studio based in london in bermondsey um and we predominantly work uh, with cultural uh, entities such as galleries museums um foundations but also with fashion brands um, um furniture brands so it's a real variety of clients um, that we have and uh, we do work in digital so we create websites uh, we do exhibition designs uh, magazines identities but also lots and lots of books um, this is kind of something that um, i started with in the beginning of my career and i continue to do so and i really really enjoy it um, this is our studio here and uh, it's not big at all it's we're keeping the team intentionally small um, for the reason of kind of keeping the quality of the work consistent and um, perhaps you know it's easier to see projects through and make sure that they are how they should be uh, so we just uh, a small group working together um, and um, our work is led by content and research, uh, which means that each project that we start, we have to create a new digital language to tell a new story. And while it's quite exciting, it's also, and you never get bored, um, it's quite exhausting actually. Um, so I ask myself, you know, why do I do this? Uh, to myself, um, always having to reinvent the wheel and, um, you know, it would be much easier to sort of design a product and then just sell that product. Um, but I always come back to the same point um, that it's like having a brain massage each time. It's a satisfaction that I get from pursuing ideas. Um, and it's it's very addictive. Does this work? <laughs> a bit like this. Um, so today I'm going to talk about my practice, the studio, and how how we got where we are today. Uh, we'll show you some projects 
um, and just maybe talk a little bit about the background where I come from and um, something that I keep thinking about over and over is that books shape you so I grew up in Siberia in Russia which was Soviet Union at the time and I had a very classic Soviet education you know I played piano uh, I had drawing classes painting classes um, and so I had very well-rounded education my parents were architects and our home um, was full of books that were visual in its their nature my dad was teaching architecture as well as practicing um, my parents loved art and so I was exposed to images from the very start um, photography this is Rochenko and so you realize that pictures and words have a lot of power and they make great impact on a young person uh, so in a way I'm a, a product of this visual education Um, and then another thing I recent, recently realized is that in my family, there are teachers, but there's a photographer, sculptor, tailor, and seamstress. And it, you know, when, you, when I look at the clients that we work with, you know, fashion, uh, art, and within art, there's sculpture, painting. Um, it's that world of um, arts. And it's funny how you can make a link from, from that. Basically, I'm surrounding myself with what I'm familiar with um, and sort of like making a second family around me by working with people that I really like. Um, so in 1989, I moved from here to here. Um, this is San Francisco. And uh, it was quite a change for me. Uh, it wasn't easy. Um, I began to um, attend art college. And uh, in, the, in the city, there was a Rizzoli bookshop that I um, would go to and sit there without being asked to leave. I didn't really buy many books because I didn't have a lot of money. But I was able to just sort of sit there and look at the books. <clears throat> it was near near the campus and I found this book um, this was during my studies that's called process a tomato project um, and it really kind of fascinated me and I, I was really so um, excited by it and that by looking at this book I just thought I've got to go to London Again, a book makes a decision for you that sort of influenced my entire life. Um, another thing I did was I went to Borders, the bookshop, again, nearby, um, that uh, had all these DNAD annuals. And I would sit in Borders and just basically systematically go through each one and uh, bookmark all the studios that I quite liked made a note of their names and addresses and basically had this master plan of coming to London to see these people and to show them my work. Uh, and I did that. I basically came to London and I, I called. This was before I had a mobile phone, so I would go to phone box and call people and uh, sometimes we would go to the wrong address. It was just really quite an adventure, but I did manage to get an internship with um, Vince Frost and uh, I, I having worked there for a couple of years I then worked with Carnoble, uh, a studio here also in London and uh, with Vince Frost I learned about uh, playful typography and uh, he loved wood, wood type and so I learned about that um, but also at Carnoble I learned that type could be uh, expressive in a different way and um, it can be all kinds of shapes and sizes and could be weird and drawn by hand and so on so it sort of um, opened up all kinds of possibilities and I learned a lot from these two studios um, then I had a, an opportunity 
I felt like I had to move on and I wanted to be more independent, but still not work for myself. But uh, I had an opportunity to come uh, have an interview at Fiden Press and they were looking for a um, design manager. And so I um, went and to be honest, I didn't really have any experience managing anyone um, but myself. But I said that I loved books and uh, they took me in. Um, I was really excited about working with Alan Fletcher. That, that was like the, basically the whole point of me coming to Fiden Press, in my view. Um, and there I had an incredible opportunity to suddenly, you know, the whole project was my own. Um, and this sense of responsibility fell on my shoulders. Um, I was really, I, I realized that this was the chance that I had to take and you either, you know, make it or, or not. Um, and so I worked really hard and uh, jumped on the opportunity. Um, and I produced interesting books. Well, I, I was interested anyway, and I enjoyed working on them. Um, and I think because I was in-house um, designer, I was able to, I had the privilege to sort of have the access to production department and I could just go downstairs and talk to them about um, what you could do, you know, what, you know, how can you squeeze the most out of the production process. So that was a huge plus. And I learned a lot about editorial uh, design and process. Um, and all of this was before I had kids and I knew that I like once I have kids, it will be much harder. So I would just stay late and work, work my ass off basically. Um, one of the last books I designed at Fiden before I got pregnant um, was this book, Premier. Um, it was quite difficult to crack because it was part of the series and um, I designed it like a newspaper rather than a book because I thought that this book was kind of like making news in the art world. Um, and so it became a completely different format from what we were expecting. Uh, because of that, it was, uh, we were able to sell it um, at a different price, much more affordable, which meant that it was more accessible to younger people. Um, and when I, um, when I uh, finished with it and uh, before I went on maternity leave, I entered this book into Type Directors Club in Tokyo and I kind of forgot about it. And so six months later, I had my baby and you know, sleepless nights and I woke up one morning to find an email in my inbox saying, you've won, <laughs> you've won the Grand Prix of that competition and we welcome you to Japan. <laughs> So it was completely over the moon. We planned this whole trip to come to Tokyo with uh, our daughter and it was going to be cherry blossom season. And um, unfortunately, the, the tsunami happened and we were not able to come to Japan. Uh, I still haven't been and I still dream about that place and imagine going to a paper shop, and basically staying forever. After... Um, after I left, well, I was on maternity leave and, you know, as it you, quite often happens during this time, you have a, an opportunity to kind of address your situation and just think about what's next, what do you want? Um, and I really wanted to start my own studio, but I still was not ready, I think, um, to just jump into it like that. And then an opportunity came to, um, I got an email from uh, Frith Care asking if I would like to come to Freeze for an interview um, because they needed a redesign and they needed a new art director. So um, it was around the corner from my place and I went and it was, uh, I spent about five and a half years there, uh, art director in the magazine and we had so much fun. Um, one of the things that 
I really enjoyed was having um, like a palette that I could invent uh, that had not only just one typeface, but several typefaces that I could then play with. Um, and uh, I also had a sort of, for each issue, a kind of um, a guest font. So it was really, really nice to have worked with this and wonderful material, of course, if it's for an art magazine, you are not short of visual material. Um, I really wanted to shake it up and introduce different kind of layouts uh, that are more fluid. I also was involved in Freeze Masters magazine, uh, designed it from scratch. Um, Freeze Masters, uh, the fair has opened while I was art directing uh, Freeze magazine. And um, it was all about um, looking at the art of the past through the contemporary lens. So we literally cut out a, a kind of lens on the cover, which would then reveal an image inside. Um, and it was interesting to think about master, the word master, you know, when I was thinking about typography, I asked myself, what is a master typeface? And Helvetica came to mind. Um, of course, it's very arguable, but um, you can't deny the power of Helvetica. And uh, I thought we could use the original cut. Um, so here I used a cast grotesque uh, designed by um, Christian Schwartz. And um, it's, it's quite nice to have such a sort of um, structural typeface that really supports whatever happens around it. So it, in the end, we were able to be quite playful. Um, and then I felt like maybe it was time to start doing other, you know, other things, but I still really enjoyed working on the magazine. And um, there was a transitional period where I started working um, half of the time with a magazine, but I started to get commissions to do uh, work on my own as a studio. And um, I'll show you some of the projects that we've been doing. And basically I just got a, a desk space initially in another studio. Uh, I got a, I hired an intern, um, from ICAL in Switzerland and together we've just started to manically work on projects, which was really exciting. Um, I'll show you, one of the first projects I'll show you will be actually the most recent project. So kind of work backwards, if you don't mind. Um, recently we've been approached by um, Mark Cropper, who is, um, in charge of James Cropper, a paper mill that has been uh, based in uh, Burneyside. Uh, it's a little village in uh, Lake District. And um, this town has a history of paper making since 1845. This is the town. Um, and it's beautiful. It's surrounded by rolling hills and uh, lakes. And it's just such a idyllic place. Um, and the, so the, the place has an amazing heritage. They've been making paper for so long and it's been the livelihood of the whole town. Um, and Mark wanted to create a foundation that would be a living and breathing institution for global community of paper devotees um, like me, people who are obsessed with paper um, and practitioners and to preserve and share the knowledge and the skills that are related to paper making and, and uh, paper associated arts as well. So it's quite a, an amazing place. Um, so we set out, he needed to have a, an identity created and we started to look first of all at um, a big book of watermarks um, that um, is a huge tome. And we just started to look at symbols that have been used by, uh, in the past, by paper makers. 
um, and tried out a few things, for example, a hand, because it's all about making, um, paper making. Um, before we settled on a house shape because of the word foundation and it's a place where um, all of this knowledge will be preserved and, and the skills will be shared. Um, when, I, when we visited Mark's office, you know, it was full of ephemera and beautiful paper related things and I saw this uh, envelope just lying there on top of, a, on top of something and I, I said, oh, what is that? And he said, well, the, you know, uh, our paper mill has made um, telegrams, first telegram that we've been printing them. Um, and this is an envelope containing a telegram. And I really loved the, the way that this type was just um, beautifully set, underlined, and it had so much character that when we went back to the studio, of course, we tried lots of different things, and but um, you know, we we looked at this these letter forms and created a replica of this uh, beautiful type. Um, we think that it was designed by Stevenson Blake, um, a very famous uh, type foundry in Britain. And we found a specimen that was um, uh, from Stevenson Blake, which matched the telegram typography. And so we set out to design a bespoke typeface that is directly influenced by this specimen. So in a way, bringing it to a contemporary time uh, and giving it a contemporary feel. Um, and so together it started to kind of gel. Um, this is a potential website uh, homepage. And on the back of this envelope, um, we noticed how lovely it is that the, the typography is even under the flap. Um, so we were exploring how we could do that and bring that into the, to the envelopes. Um, Mark showed us this, these amazing registered letter envelopes um, that he has in his archive. Um, and so we based the envelope shapes on this envelope. So everything is sort of linked back to the heritage and to the, to the, to the place. Um, so that to get, you know, then the identity really has a, a reason for being the way it is um, and choosing papers carefully and the colors, they all stem from um, these kind of earthy, earthy colors that are found in the Lake District. Um, um, another project that I can show you is I actually don't know whether it's, <laughs> I think it's been printed. I think it's about to be released. It's really exciting. It's a book about Mary Ellen Mark and it's called The Book of Everything. Mary Ellen Mark is an amazing, amazing person. Um, she's beautiful and talented and she, she was such a fantastic photographer. She, for, she was a hugely compassionate person. And um, she, this compassion was, a, was her kind of true um, character. And with this, with this compassion, she got to know people and get, uh, sort of gain their trust and confidence. And um, she has uh, kept in touch with them for years after having met them. And she really, um, she photographed sort of the outcast of the society, homeless, mental patients, uh, drug addicts. Um, not only, she photographed other people as well, you know, celebrities and uh, film stars. But um, she was just really, I think, genuinely interested in people. Um, when we were thinking about, you know, the book of everything and how, what typography we should use, you know, because uh, Mary Ellen Mark traveled so much around the world, 
um, and she traveled quite a lot to India and um, you know rough areas and poor areas we thought about sort of hand painted signs um, and sort of vernacular of the street almost like posters or um, shop signs and because of the title as well that it's such a the book of everything you know it is almost uh, asked and requ required a presence. So size and scale is something that we thought about as well. Uh, you know, physically being present on a page. Um, and so we um, drawn up this type from, from a found, from another source um, and created a cover slipcase from which a cover would emerge with uh, Mary Allen's picture. Um, that's the back of the slipcase. Uh, and I'll show you some spreads of the book. Um, so this, this project has a really long story, which I'll spare you too many details, but basically um, we designed lots of um, kind of complicated uh, pages which meant that the binding was going to be very difficult and expensive and um, the book is over 800 pages so we we this is the original design but eventually uh, it will be simplified because of the constraints um, various reasons and uh, sort of constraints in production and um, binding uh, which was really quite heartbreaking, but it will still be beautiful. It will still be printed beautifully by Steidel. Um, I went to meet with Gerhard Steidel and discussing this project. Um, it was quite interesting. But yeah, he, he was talking about how skills and technology um, and knowledge of binding that many pages together, you know, it may have been possible 10 years ago, but it's, it's disappearing. Um, which is quite sad. Um, and so we had to adjust to, to what we could actually physically do. So the, the book is broken up into decades and it's basically her whole career. So this will be now three volume book, uh, quite a heavy, heavy object. Um, when I first came to London, uh, Vince Frost was working on Whopping Project. Um, the, it was his client. And when I first went to visit the place where it's based, the Whopping Project, I was astonished and I thought, oh my God, this is why I, I came to London. This is the best thing. It, basically, the Whopping Project was based in a, um, a old power station, hydraulic power station that used to pump water uh, and generate electricity. Um, and it's just an incredible place. Uh, it's no longer used for the Whopping project and whopping project is more like a, a platform that can exist in many different locations. But um, I wanted to sort of when we started to design. So I've been asked to design, redesign the identity for uh, for whopping project after it's been sort of misplaced from the after it's stopped using this building as a base and sort of to move it on to the to the next stage but when we were designing the identity we still wanted to look at the building that it was sort of born in and so we noticed that in the roof um, if I'll go back if you see on in the roof uh, trestles there are all these um, triangular shapes and here to uh, the, the roof support. And so we looked at those shapes and we wanted to um, translate them typographically. And we wondered what could be comparable 
um, in terms of typography. Um, and we looked at these slanted shapes, uh, geometric shapes. And so we modified a typeface to create this W for whopping. And, um, and then also modified some of the letters. So not all letters are modified, just some. But it created an interesting kind of combination where things are still legible, but they're a little bit different. Um, we created a, a website and a system how this logo can work for various purposes. Um, and the uh, Whopping project also publishes, uh, it commissions uh, work um, and it publishes uh, publications. So they're small publications and they're very modest, um, but they're really fun to work with. And we, we use Bible paper inside, and this is something that uh, connects back to the original work by Vince Frost. He used uh, Bible paper for posters, um, I remember. So I thought it was a nice connection to the past. And this is one of the recent um, publications we've done. Um, one of the projects uh, that, um, or commissions that Whopping Project commissioned was uh, a sort of a series of uh, pieces of music that Laura Cannell um, has recorded with a, a violin. She went into the Whopping Project uh, building to the, um, into the power station, which is now empty. Um, and she's recorded music. Uh, so we've been asked to design the a vinyl with these tracks. Um, and we were really able to experiment with typography and reflect the, all the shapes that are seen inside this building. Um, without being too literal. Um, as Simon mentioned, I have been working with uh, Hauser & Wirth on numerous projects. Um, and I really love working together with Hauser & Wirth. Um, they produce books, so they have Hauser & Wirth uh, publishers as a kind of branch of the gallery and they produce beautiful books. They really care about production values and this is something that really resonates with me. Um, one of the projects we have done together is that we've created a brand identity for them, um, which wasn't easy because there was the, you know, the identity of the gallery, uh, which of course is the, is the parent, but then there, you know, there was a need for a symbol for the publishers. And so we created out of the letters using the, the typeface that is inherently uh, the gallery's type, um, transport, we just put them together in a different way to create a monogram. And now it appears on all the books and it has a, its own identity within the gallery. Uh, one of the books we uh, were working on is Calder. Um, and each time that we do a book, we try to invent something or use um, a different kind of binding or use special papers that really reflect um, the subject matter. And that's what I mean when I said about research-based design, you know, each time we are trying to think about um, what, is, what is of the essence here. Uh, so the paper on the cover of this book is um, quite textured and almost reminiscent of, um, of the stones uh, and um, in the landscape uh, that uh, Calder is talking about. Um, he, his, he had a massive studio in the middle of uh, countryside, so very rural setting. And this, the exhibition connected to this book was um, set in um, Somerset, Hauser and Worth Somerset. Um, and so 
there was kind of a need for lots of texture and sort of to reflect this rural rural environment um, So this book is divided in two parts. Uh, there were several essays with archival material and pictures. And then the second part was the, um, the plates and the views of the exhibition. Um, so we thought it would be really nice to have this duality of two books in one and to, uh, have a clear separation between the two. So these are the texts. And these are the images. And together they, there's a sort of break of color in the middle of the book, which is, you know, color is such an essential part of Calder's work. We intentionally used um, colors that were not uh, primary. There's a lot of primary colors in his work, but there are also non-primary colors. And we picked those out so that not to be sort of predictable um, and slightly off, off the beaten track. Um, one of the projects that, another project that uses interesting binding uh, is a project for uh, Gallery Ropak uh, and Donald Judd. Um, we were really excited to receive this commission and we, worked closely with uh, Flavin Judd, uh, the son of uh, Donald Judd. And um, together with him, we came up with um, a binding that really reflects um, Donald Judd's work. Um, if you look at his uh, prints, there is the slant, you know, constantly uh, repeated. And these prints were in the gallery. So that was sort of the, the decision to introduce the slant. Uh, it was quite difficult to achieve and uh, because it's sort of non-standard. So there was a lot of back and forth. Um, and I think we, we managed to, to come up with um, an interesting solution. Um, this was a sketch that Flavin sent us and he, it was his idea. And, uh, you know, I won't, I can't claim it, but um, I, what I have learned from this experience is that when, you know, there is such a collaboration, um, you have to learn to embrace this and to, to use it, um, to have a dialogue. This is a picture that he sent to us. Um, another project, um, completely different project, that is not really about binding as such. It uses um, illustration and typography. Um, it's a Noma restaurant uh, in Copenhagen. And when I was asked to be part of this project, um, I mean, I've long admired Paula Troxler, who is a, an illustrator based in Zurich. She's a fellow RG member, and I, I really love her work. Um, you know, it's very humorous. It, she has her own style. Um, um, and she, she, does, she sort of does a drawing a day, and she publishes them. Um, and I sort of fell in love with these drawings. And I, when I was being, when we were talking about the project with Rene Rezepi, he was saying that it would be nice to have um, maybe some something in the book that might be a little drawings or something like this. And I immediately thought of Paula. Um, so this is Rene Rezepi and um, the chef who is responsible for, um, David Zilber, who is responsible for fermentation lab. Uh, and so this was a guide to fermentation and with this book, which they call a kind of manual, they really wanted a manual, um, you would learn all about, you know, this process. Um, that's the restaurant and the beautiful food um, that they serve. And this is the lab that I went to visit. Um, and it had incredible 
sort of just full of pots and things bubbling away um, or very sciency. Uh, and I, I, it was really interesting to learn. For me, it's a completely new, new thing to learn about. Uh, there are lots of textures um, to appreciate, and I love the I love the feeling of sort of it's almost like a um, yeah a science lab. So uh, we've commissioned Paula to to work with us, and um, parallel to that, we we were thinking about the general direction for the for the book and the book cover. And because uh, Rene Rizepi wanted to to make it feel like a functional manual, we thought about well, what is what is a manual, and shall we look at uh, maybe textbooks? Um, how do those look? Um, and so we were influenced by that, really. Uh, that was a starting point. Um, here were some initial sketches where we wanted to have um, tabs for each section. Again, production-wise, it was too expensive to do this. Um, these were early sketches, what we were imagining. Uh, they they didn't go ahead, <laughs> but um, but this has happened. So this was the end result. Um, we wanted to have some textures um, on the cover, so there are two different materials sort of juxtaposed together, and um, the hand on the cover sort of symbolizes this simple act of making and doing it yourself or learning how to do something with your hands. And so inside the book, uh, there's a lot of illustration which really live, you know, make, make it more lively the, the, because the subject matter is quite um, full on, you know, it's very, very, there's a lot of text. And so the illustrations help to make it lively and fun. Also, we were very um, aware of legibility and, you know, having the text easy to follow for someone who is learning how to ferment. Um, I think this is, we're probably nearing to the end. Um, something to, yeah, another project to, to show you. Uh, this was a book commissioned by Gagosian Gallery, and there was an exhibition in um, London of, uh, Peter Lindbergh has taken pictures of Alberto Giacometti sculptures, and the result was absolutely stunning. Um, and so when I was asked to, to work on this, I immediately said yes, and um, I like Peter Lindbergh's work. It's so atmospheric. And I also love um, the sculptures of Giacometti. So together it was really a dream project. Um, one of the things that were, you know, in the brief was that the project couldn't be pr uh, produced in an expensive way and it had to be quite simple. So uh, we produced instead of having a hard cover, which costs a lot, um, we went for something more like a paperback, but then we experimented and played around with the flaps and the materiality of, and the physicality of the cover. Um, and so the images could really be playful. We used, um, different paper stocks inside to create interest and pace. Uh, for example, the title page is Bible paper, so sort of semi-transparent and very ethereal. Um, and so these two totally different sort of images had to be living together in this book side by side. So 
um, very kind of factual and documentary style images together with Peter's images. And the insertion of this pre-dyed paper really did the trick of separating them, but also introducing pace to the book so that it wouldn't get too monotonous um, and sort of almost like these interjections of color really worked together with full bleed images. Um, had some pull outs and yeah, in the end, I, I think it's interesting to think about that not everything that costs a lot is good. <laughs> you know, you can create something that is interesting and intriguing uh, even with a paperback. That's all that I have for now. Um, and I'd love to answer any questions that you may have. Um, thank you so much, Sonia. Thank you so much. Um, wonderful. Um, it's interesting to me, we, uh, I'd mentioned before, you didn't actually show the Roth bar and grill identity <laughs> here, but um, I, as I've mentioned before, I've eaten in there many times and I'd always wondered who, who designed the identity and, and uh, admired um, the capital R, which has come up a few times in a few projects. Mm. Uh, there's something about the capital R that always reveals the full voice of the typeface somehow. Um, certainly in that one, it has the, has the right amount of the wrongness, I would say. Um, <laughs> I, I, what I really enjoy about uh, your work is that it seems to have a very kind of unified, uh, it's unified by a sense of, um, I would say, sophisticated quality rather than a particular uh, style. And um, I love its uh, sort of understatement, um, but it has personality at the same time with a confident sense of uh, a typographic voice. So I'm just curious, and I know you've been to some rides and you, you do your research and so forth. Am I right in thinking that um, once you feel like you have the right sort of tone of voice typographically, that there's then no need to sort of overwork uh, the situation? Can you, can you talk a little bit mm. about that, that part of your process? Uh, yes, I think that's right. I, I'm very tempted every time to to go further. And um, this is something I actually really struggle with internally because I see other designers really going for it. And, um, you know, I, I want to do that too. <laughs> and I never managed to, to do it uh, or, because, because it just doesn't seem to go with the with the subject matter and right. so i want to kind of go crazy and do something but then i think uh, when i think what is it for and what's the artist gonna say then i just can't um can't push that far i i do i don't i do show sometimes ideas that are far out and more challenging but um it's quite difficult because you know when it comes to artists that you know their work is right there you know it's not about me and my type design <laughs> so it's i'm just, trying to yeah it's that, there that work. was going to be it, the, i had a related question to that uh, along the idea of um framing i mean we, we both design i design books as well for artists and uh, when you're presenting the work someone else's work um your design work has to be has to kind of frame their work present it amplify it somehow without getting in the way overpowering um yeah. And so that, that challenge of finding an appropriate frame to complement the work, um, the frame can't be totally neutral, obviously. We all have to make design decisions. It's got to look like something. Um, so what would you say your approach uh, to finding that right balance is? Obviously, as you just discussed, you, you don't ever want to go too far. I think we've all seen situations mm. where when the design gets overworked, it somehow the design almost becomes about itself rather than... Mm being about the, the work that it's showing. And what, what's your um, approach to that, do you think? Well, I think for us, it's always the same. Basically, we come up with a whole caboodle of like, we could do this and we could do this and we can do that. And then inevitably, the process of the dialogue with the client and the gallery, you know, be, sure, be assured it will be watered down. <laughs> <laughs> you know don't you worry about that but so can, can refinement also happen in that process as well oh absolutely yes yeah. and um through that process in a way I'm, I'm not saying it's a negative thing but uh through that process you refine but it, it's all always like um 
you know, we're edging, we're always trying to, to push a bit more. Mm -hmm. um, and then, okay, maybe this comes away and maybe this comes away. So uh, with every project at the beginning, there's a lot of ideas of what we could do. And then naturally some of these fall away. And so then it, the, it's almost like, um, uh, in, how do you say? Yeah. Refining sort of things just fall away and then you are ending, ending up with like essential, essential elements that you cannot do without. And I am the gatekeeper of that, mm -hmm. you know, when Absolutely. it starts to feel like, Oh my God, we're going to end up with absolutely no character whatsoever. Then I have to fight tooth and nail for those details to stay in. And right. sometimes it's easier and sometimes it's harder. And a lot of, I have to say a lot of people don't want anything experimental. Mm -hmm. They just, you know, I just keep coming up to that. Sometimes it's so disappointing because you want to do something so special and so different, but you know, people, most people just want regular things. Right. But then it can become too neutral and loses a sense of, uh, exactly. of or presence, which books obviously need to have. Yes. Um, I found, a, I found a quote from an interview um, that you did with Elephant Magazine because I thought it would be useful for students um, mm. just to talk about your approach to the design process. Um, you, you were referring to a period that you spent working, as you mentioned, at uh, Kerr Noble. Um, and this is your quote. We spent a lot of time researching and thinking about a project rather than rushing to the computer to try some ideas quickly. I mm. realized that if you put time and effort into research, the actual execution bit then takes less time because you have done your homework. So I really like that. I think it's very useful for students to think about that a lot um, mm. and immerse themselves in the subject matter before you start doing anything. Um, can you expand on that a little yeah, bit? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, when I was at Chernobyl, it, it was a real revelation of how um, Amelia and Frith used to work. And it, it was a really... Um, I think they really put a lot of accent on the research and looking at things, thinking about references. Um, I think your, before your that foundation project, I'm thinking of your paper foundation project where you, you really see you did your research there. And how yeah, much you, you dig and you dig. Yeah. Um, and actually this is something so important that um, it's also for a client, very important to see that you, these ideas are based on real things. Um, for example, just now we are doing an identity for, for a project and because of the lockdown, we were not able to go there in person. And so when we presented all kinds of ideas, the client said, well, you know, yes, they're all very nice, but I'm not sure what I should be choosing because it's not based on anything. And so we had to go on the train. Luckily the rules have relaxed and we've done so much research that we were able to say, to come, come back to him and, and show him. And actually he liked one of the routes that we presented originally. So, um, you know, me and my designer are looking at each other like, we, you know, we're, we're back to what we, where we started. But the, the fact is there is um, now research that backs it up. Right. And um, from, the student, from the student's point of view, it means that once you've done all of that research, it means your designs are always coming from a place of understanding uh, and right. connection to the subject. I have, I have a, a little comment and also um, the fact I think you show how important it is to be tactile. And when you said, and I think for students especially, that it's important to touch books, yes. to touch paper, because you don't understand the process of, especially a book, which is an object. You know, we talk about books as information, but the book becomes an object. And I think you, I think you demonstrated, especially to students, how important it is to physically research and to physically touch objects and papers and books. You cannot get this digitally. I do have a comment from someone, and this is just, it's from April Griman, by the way. She oh, says, great. she said, the two of you are, have, are, are the most fantastic and, be, and best designers, book designers. And she said, please <laughs> excuse her. She said in the last 40 years, she said, she didn't want to age oh you guys. Oh my God, she's so <laughs> sweet. But, but I just wanted to say so, and I, and, and I actually agree especially within the world of art, when you're, you're dealing with the physicality, right, 
of the artist work and the physicality of your work. Mm. And I think you've explained it, you know, both of you have this incredible ability to understand that physic physicality of it. And I'm not quite sure. I, I refer to it as the thingness of the thing. <laughs> and yeah, it's just, it's just the idea that, that, that books like, like sculpture, like, pots. I, it was interesting to, to hear about your background. My, my mother was a potter, so I grew up around oh, pots all the time. But pots, like books, they have presence. Mm. And this, anything on screen can never have that. So the sense of um, you're putting an object out into the world that wasn't there before, it's, a, it's an amazing thing to be able to do. And, uh, you know, book as object, I think, has since the digital revolution has become... Um, you know, it's, it's become a, it's been resurrected to a certain extent. Mm. And I think we've, we've, we're finding what you can do with books that, that you can't do online. And uh, that's made them all the more interesting. And your Judd book, for example, oh. spectacular example of that. <laughs> I, I, I was, I have to say, I was amazed when I saw that. You know, you I still know. have questions about how is that? How is it how bound? Is it bound? Right? Not so much the binding, because that's still at the spine, but it's the edges. How does, how does that even work when you're building the file? Right. Yeah, <laughs> we had to physic. We had to take away from each page a few limit a millimeters at a time. Um, there was no. There was no. <laughs> and luckily, my designer was able to do this because you know me and math. They do, we don't mix very well. Um, but yeah, it was. Um, I think that also books. You know. It's it's a chance to slow down. You know when we perceive information online digitally there's so much of it and it just keeps coming it never stops and um, when you have a book in your hand suddenly there's a sort of quiet and silence and I think there's so much noise and it's all good you know I am uh, consuming it as well as like just like everyone else but it's so nice to sort of slow down and stop for a while and just look at a book it's just really uh, and there's no there's no clock there's no clock in the top right corner <laughs> <laughs> no no and you know if you want to switch everything off and just like sit with a book it's just really lovely yeah so you know it's it's really interesting and i think everyone um some of the comments that have come in um not mostly questions but they're really grateful that you shared your process and your thoughts and I'm to glad. show and i mean i mean it's so important people you know, we'll look at an object and they'll go, well, how was that done? Or what were you thinking? And so, so many people have uh, expressed in the Q&A how, how they're so happy and grateful that you demonstrated this. You know, it's so rare when someone does a presentation that they actually talk about the detailing of it. You that's know, great. I I'm, think, I'm and I, I want to thank you both for that. I mean, that's a, you know, it gets lost today digitally sometimes, you know, mm. how you can understand the detailing of these designs. Your images are beautiful, but then how does one approach that imagery? And I, and I think that's, uh, you know, we'll have to bring you back, Sonia. <laughs> I Somehow, to... Simon, we're going to have to think about this, right? How she'll talk about taking it from one, from point A to point Z, or point right. Z, if you would say. We'll have to work on that. We'll have to work on that. And I want to thank everyone. And thank you, and guys. Thank you again. Thanks, thank Sonia. you. Thank really you. Enjoy. Thank pleasure. you, Simon. Thank you, sure. Sonia. It's been a pleasure. <laughs> and thank everyone. you all for attending. Yeah, we'll see yes. you again in, in two weeks. So thank Fantastic. you. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Bye. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, guys. Bye.